Hi everyone, just before we get started today, I just wanted to jump in and say that this is a special video that we filmed on location. Now, these videos obviously take a lot more time and certainly a lot more money to make, and we can do them partly because of sponsors like today's sponsor, Crossout. Crossout is a free-to-play action game, and you can support today, I found out, and get a starter set with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin, all by going through the link in the description below. And now, today's special video. This behind me here is the largest plane by wingspan that was ever built. It was flown in 1947 by Howard Hughes. It's called the H4 Hercules, also known as the Spruce Goose, although Howard Hughes himself did not like that name. This plane has been here since 1993 in the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon. And I feel with things like this, you know, you can talk about them, but when it's something so huge, it's always better to come and see it in person. So that's why I'm here. We're gonna take a look around inside this plane and talk a bit about it. So this is, are we inside the main? This is where the people would, because I mean, this place, this could hold two tanks. Two or, tanks or 700 troops. Yeah. So it actually was designed to have another deck in here. So it would be, there would be a whole nother level in here. So you'd have troops above, troops below. Yeah. It's designed as a boat. It's the fuel tanks. There's none in the wings. It's all down in the in the keel. Yeah. So it's it's as big as you can get. Yeah. Um, it, at the time, the biggest thing flying was a DC three, and and I can show you one later. So how how just in terms of size, like comparatively, how big was the DC three compared to? Because one thing, I you walk in here, into this into this space, and this is. Just, I mean, even compared to the modern jets outside, this thing is, is huge. And you can kind of, just looking to the back here, the scale is huge. How big was the DC? Because that's a contemporary plane, right? It, it flew, it was flying at the same time, but it's about like one sixth the size of this. Okay. So that's why everybody said, when they looked at, that was the biggest airplane flying, they go, you're insane. This thing will never fly because yeah. of the size. Just the weight was too much or there wasn't enough power in the engine? Just or? the size. Just I mean, shit. just trying to lift this much off the off the water yeah and Hughes had to develop things that had never been done before it's the first hydraulically actuated airplane because you have to be able to move the flight controls a, a person can't do that it's the first AC powered airplane so it's got house current in it yeah so it because you couldn't run wires like they were running at the time they were too big it would weigh too much so you'd need the alternating current to get the wire to get the power to the other end of the plane exactly it's, it's got all kinds of you know first and and he didn't patent any of that because he says if it benefits aviation that's all that mattered to him <laughs> This is famously like nicknamed the Spruce Goose, and I think Howard Hughes didn't like this, right? He did not like that name. He he did yeah. not like any name. But it's not Spruce, right? Right. It's, it's, it's mostly birch. And so I won't tell you what the nickname that goes with birch. Why did they choose to build it out of wood? Was it because of wartime? Or it was. was. Just... No no wartime materials could be used. So it could not be any, any aluminum, any of the wartime materials. You couldn't use wartime engineers. So he had to take people fresh out of college. So you couldn't take any aeronautical engineers that had been in the business. Wow. And you couldn't take any aeronautical workers. So most, most of them were cabinet makers. But it was, it was commissioned by the military, right? It they, was. And they just were like, no, you've got to do it yourself. You're rich enough. That's right. And, and, well, and he had teamed with Henry Kaiser when it first started. Yeah. So, and Henry Kaiser came up with the idea that, look, if we can fly over, the U-boats won't shoot us down. So obviously now we're up at the, is it, was it called a flight deck? Is this what you'd call the, it? Yes, the cockpit. I'm quite excited to so say this is where <laughs> Howard Hughes sat and flew this thing. Exactly. You're, you're sitting exactly where Howard was sitting. So, and, and the d gentleman here named Dave Grant was sitting in this seat and he was the hydraulics engineer. So they decided to take the thing out that day and do some taxi tests with it. Yeah. So all the press was on board. They, they did their taxi tests. Everything was fine. He had not filled it up with fuel. So 
the reporters all had to get off the airplane to go post their stories. Yeah. And this is before cell phones and everything else, so it's all the teletype and everything. So, so they all left, and there was one one news person left on it, and so he decided to do one more run. So, th Long Beach Harbor is three miles long. So he taxis for a mile, calls for ten degrees of flaps. It comes into ground effects and it lifts out of the water. Now. Howard had never flown a hydraulically actuated airplane. His first reaction was was to pull the throttles back and then have it go back down to the ground. Yeah. Because Dave Grant was sitting here, he goes, you gotta power it back up and fly it back onto the water because you have no flight controls when you shut the hydraulics down. Yeah. So he powered it back up and, and he flew for a mile, 75 feet high, and then he had a mile to get it back down because he was heading to open ocean and it would have tore the airplane apart if he'd have got out in the open sea. Yeah. So he managed to get it, and the rest is history. So he would sit here and have all of these controls. The, uh, uh, because you were saying downstairs, the hydraulic engineer, this was the kind of first plane where, because everything is so far away, you have to have all these hydraulics. Exactly. So he, rather than a co-pilot, he had some guy who was, who was managing this stuff, or what was his role? All like, he was, he was just sitting in this seat. He was, he was just the expert at how hydraulics work. It's fascinating. So I've got all these controls here. This is what Howard Hughes would be using. He's got all of this stuff. But what? what why do I have a pipe and you don't have a pipe? Because one, one of Howard Hughes' idiosyncrasies was he wanted cold air blowing on the back of his neck when he flew. So that pipe actually spins around and points right at the back of your head. And so he would be comfortable and the guy over here would not be. Well. It's very how it is in a way. It is. It I is thought at first it would be like, you know, I don't know, and you see in these old submarines or right. whatever, where you'd have a tube going to the back and it would be like, your heart to starboard. Or right, whatever. right. <laughs> right, more power. You're yelling yeah. at Scotty, more power, so. Yeah. Kind of symbol of power for Hughes in a way. It you is. Know, he's the air conditioned one. Well, and he was the only one that was going to fly it, so I mean, that was always his. Yeah, he needs to be in his right mindset. Yes. So we've got uh, you sitting here in the hydraulics engineer, I'm in the pilot seat. There's the press seats back there. There's also a few seats, two seats here, another seat here. Yes. Who was sitting there? The, the flight engineer? Or? The flight engineer was sitting in the panel right behind me here. The radio operator is sitting there. The other, the other components were test equipment to see how the airplane would react. Yeah. So they, they were actually doing flight testing at the same time. And the thing did twist and turn quite a bit. So that, that's why... There, there was a bunch of modifications made to the airplane after it flew because things that they found out when it did actually lift off the water. So I was reading, they can, it would, kind of, it would fly with some upgrades. I, I don't know if this was just an internet article being it, a little bit speculative. It, it, it is just being speculative because because one of the problems is this, this wingspan right above us is the same size as a B-17 wing. And, and so consequently, if you do any flight controls, it wants to, yeah. the tail moved almost six feet. So three feet each way is what the tail was moving when he flew. Yeah. Uh, there was actually a guy on a, on a uh, chain ladder that goes up into the tail that was on it when it flew. But yeah, that's a DC-3. So this is its contemporary. Yes. So, so, so when this flew <laughs> in 19... It inside. Yes. My 1947, that was the biggest airplane flying. Is this plane's wingspan shorter than this? Yes. So the wingspan of its tail is as large as a B-17 bomber? Yes. That is nuts. Yes. Why did it not fly again? Did they not see a use for it? Or, I mean, the war's over, but I mean... There's well, he wars. ended up with it. Yeah. And, and so then he built the climate-controlled building. Yeah. And, and seven times he called and says, Wait, I'm what? taking her out. Okay. Never showed up. Okay. You know, but, but that was his whole thing is, yeah, he, he wanted to fly it again. Yeah. Um, but he had crashed the XF-11 and broke his back. Yeah. And so, and then he almost drowned in a seaplane in Lake Tahoe learning how to fly a seaplane. So, and, and it just never did. So basically, that was the end of the story. The plane flew in 1947, which was two years after the war ended. Essentially, he did it because the Senates were basically saying, hey, Mr. Hughes, did you waste all of our money? Does this thing actually fly? He was getting in a bit of trouble. 
He wanted to show them that the plane did fly, but there wasn't much of a demand for it after that flight. So essentially, this thing, it was hermetically sealed for a long time and maintained by a crew of 300 people. Eventually, it was actually purchased by Disney, and then eventually, it came here to Evergreen. And that's pretty much the story of the Hughes H2 Hercules, or as he wouldn't want it called, the Spruce Goose. So just before we go, a bit of a bonus fact, because in this museum there is something else that is exceptionally cool. Now, in fact, there's a lot of stuff that's exceptionally cool, but this is a plane I've wanted to see since I was a kid. I'd seen this in textbooks and all over the internet. This is the SR-71 Blackbird. It was built in the 1960s, but to this day, this is the fastest and highest flying plane that has ever existed. And it's also huge. Like, you see it in the pictures, does not do it justice, much like that other enormous plane. But this is... Uh, an incredible feat of engineering and uh, pretty amazing to be able to see one of these. So the SR-71 Blackbird, and that's your bonus fact. Thanks for watching. Hi again, everyone. So this is probably my favorite video that we've ever made. It was a real pleasure to go out and be able to do this one. So I also wanted to thank Crossout for making it all possible. Crossout is a vehicle action game set in a post-apocalyptic future where you have to battle to dominate the lands. And well, how do you do that? Well, you build your own vehicle, of course. However, you might like from all sorts of scavenged parts. The game is a lot of fun, even as a beginner. And as I said, it's totally free to play. It's fast paced, it's action filled, and you can be super creative with your vehicle. You can also play it on PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox. So join me on the battlefield for free by using the link in the description below, and you'll get a starter set with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin as a bonus just for registering. Why not? Once again, thanks to Crossout for sponsoring this video, and thank you for watching.